Hey everyone, a very happy Tuesday and welcome back to our Arm Tech Talk series. This is the place for the latest and greatest trends, technologies and best practices from Arm and our ecosystem partners. I'm joining you today live from our Cambridge studio in our headquarters. It's great to have you with you uh, with us wherever you're joining us from. I uh, hope you enjoyed last week's Tech Talk in particular. It was a really great Tech Talk from Gravity uh, and they spoke about how they've used uh, TVM and our ethos you in a really exciting uh, and innovative wildlife trap camera application. So if you've missed that, just go to youtube.com slash arm. It's all there for you to check out. Please do go and check it out. Uh, and you, you love, you'll love the recording. But this week, we're actually going to be, we're actually joined by Plumerai and Cedric from Plumerai is going to talk about how they've used helium vector extensions. So this is a really exciting uh, innovation from ARM and we're really excited to see how Plumerai have used this. And I'm sure you are too. Uh, but before we get to today's tech talk, I've got a few housekeeping items, as I normally do if you've been to one of these before, you know the drill, uh, because uh, you probably want me to get these over and done with as quickly as possible. Let's just move on to the next slide before Cedric tells you a bit more how uh, they've used Helium Vector extensions. So if you want to get involved in the conversation, you can, of course, use the hashtag Arm Tech Talks on any of your social media platform of choice. Make sure you tag Arm as well. Uh, we'd be delighted to hear where you're joining us from and uh, what you enjoyed most about today's tech talk. All of our upcoming talks uh, are on YouTube, are on arm.com slash tech talks, and all of our past talks are on youtube.com slash arm. Uh, so do go and check those out. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of them. We do these every week. So we don't think, I think this might be the 75th talk now, Cedric. You've hit a milestone. Uh, so uh, it's really great to have you for our 75th tech talk. Uh, so all of these past 74 talks are on YouTube. So do go and check those out. And all of our upcoming talks, as I mentioned, are on arm.com. Uh, speaking of what's coming up, we're going to shift gears actually from uh, next week. We're going to start to a bit more about some really exciting infrastructure talks. Uh, so if you're interested in either of those two talks, one's from Carnegie Mellon University and the other one's from Synopsys. And then we've got another talk on October 17th that will be along a similar theme of infrastructure. Do check those out. They'll be 17th of October and will go live very soon. Uh, but the October 3rd and 10th are already live. So just go to arm.com slash tech talks to register now uh, and make sure you secure your space at one of those so you can uh, attend the webinar and ask the panelists your questions. Uh, but we want to, of course, hear about today how Plume or I have used uh, are using helium vector extensions in people detection to accelerate people detection. So I'm thrilled today to be joined by Cedric from Plumerai. He's going to give today's tech talk. Before I hand over to him, as usual, uh, if you've attended one of these tech talks before, you know how to ask Q&A. It's in the Zoom Q&A box below. If you haven't, just go to the Zoom menu bar at the bottom of your screen, uh, or if you're on YouTube, head to the link I've just pasted in the chat. You can go to our Zoom uh, webinar, head to the menu bar at the bottom, click Q&A, and get your questions in at the end. We've got a really exciting tech talk uh, for you today. You're going to learn a hell of a lot, but make sure you get your questions in at the end, because that's where I really enjoy hearing from you. So, Cedric, it's great for you to join us today. I'm so glad you, glad you could join us today. Uh, why don't you take it away with today's Arm Tech Talk, please, on how you've used Helium Vector extensions. Thank you, Tobias. Um, yes, uh, welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Cedric Nuchteren. Um, I'm, I'm with Plumerai in the Netherlands. And today I will talk about accelerating Plumerai people detection with Arm Helium Vector extensions. In short, what we do is we take this people detection application, we put it on an ARM Cortex-M85, and then we attach some balloons to it. And these balloons are, of course, filled with, with helium. So let's see what we, um, let's first see what we do at Plumerai. So at Plumerai, our goal is to run complex computer vision tasks on tiny devices efficiently. And here in the background, you see an example of what we do. And this example, people detection, is also the topic for today's talk. So as you can see in the videos, uh, the, the quality of people detection, the accuracy is, is very good. It handles people far away, it handles occlusions, and it can also track uh, individuals. But what's really impressive about this is that all of, these, uh, all of this runs on a small, small computers, such as microcontrollers. And in this presentation, we will show how this runs at 13 frames per second on a microcontroller, thanks to Helium, of course. So in today's talk, I'll first say a few words about vector extensions and SIMD in general, and then go into uh, the details of ARM Helium. I'll then say a few words about our neural networks and how we make them so, so small and efficient at Boomerang. I'll put those two together and show a demo on a Renaissance board, which is equipped with an ARM Cortex-M85. Then I'll go into more depth 
of what we did to become so fast using helium. And finally, I'll show a glimpse into the future, first by talking a bit about the ARM ethos U, a neural processing unit, and second by showing more exciting applications to come from, uh, from Plumerai that can benefit from, from helium acceleration. So let's talk about helium and uh, let's start with vector extensions and uh, I'll try to explain first what they are for those that are not familiar. So here in this slide, 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 I'll explain the concept of single instruction, multiple data. So here on the left, you see uh, an example application where we do a normal scalar operation. So we have two sets of values, uh, A1, A2, A3, A4, et cetera. And we multiply them to obtain C1, C2, C3, and C4. And in this example program, if you would run this on a processor, it would be uh, four individual instructions, four multiplications to obtain the results. Now you can compute the exact same thing in a SIMD fashion. So in this case, there's only a single instruction, single multiplication, but you operate on multiple data elements at the same time. So A1, A2, A3, A4 are now no longer individual scalar values, but they are stored in a so-called vector register. Right, And this is the concept of SIMD. It still um, produces the same exact results, but you do this in a different way by um, operating on multiple data at the same time. And you, that way you can reduce the number of instructions. So this is all, um, SIMD is, is, all, uh, is, is what vector extensions are all about. And if you had a PC back in the, in the days of 1990, six or so you might be familiar with these logos 3d now or mmx might be uh, on your on your pcs um, but more recently you might be more familiar with SSE or avx so these are also simd or vector extensions um, but for x86 processors now for arm processors there are also uh, simd extensions and um, and this is called arm neon and arm neon has been out there also for quite a while and is used a lot uh, in Cortex A devices. Now, microcontrollers uh, didn't have these up to uh, recently uh, when ARM introduced the MVE or helium vector extensions. Uh, MVE is, is short for M profile vector extensions. And here M refers to Cortex M class uh, processors. So before I go into details of helium, I'll first say a few words about why vector extensions and why SIMD is a good idea. So here you see a diagram of a typical micro microprocessor architecture. Uh, it is a very simplified diagram, but don't worry, you don't have to understand what's going on here in details. Um, but the important message here is that what I want to show is how we can transform this into a SIMD execution pipeline. First thing we do is we take this ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, the one that does the multiplications, and we put multiple of those or we'll make it wider such that it can do four multiplications at the same time, for example. Second thing is we make our register file bigger uh, or we place a second register file. And then that's about it. There are some small other modifications that you have to do, but those are our details. So the main benefits of SIMD here are that you can get a factor n better throughput in theory, for example, factor four, if you have a SIMD width of four, but the extra hardware and the extra energy costs that you have to pay are very limited, right? You don't have to quadruple this whole, uh, all the hardware, you only quadruple certain uh, smaller components. And that makes SIMD a very good idea. And that's also why it's been out there for a long time in a lot of processors. Now there are uh, drawbacks, of course, with SIMD. First of all, that not all software is vectorizable, but of course you can still fall back to the normal scalar execution pipeline. Um, and sometimes there's also a bit of overhead to get it, get your data in the right shape. But overall, SIMD seems to be a good idea. And therefore we were also very happy to see that SIMD has now been uh, uh, there for uh, micro uh, controllers. So let's talk about ARM Helium. So in this table, I'll 
I'll make a comparison between ARM Neon for Cortex A uh, class uh, devices and ARM Helium for Cortex M. And on, uh, for ARM Neon, the SIMD width is 128 bit. That means four 32 bit words. So, for example, 30, four 32 bit uh, floating point values or integers uh, can be processed at the same time. Data comes from caches typically, uh, and the, the data width is also matching this 128 bit. Now, ARM Helium is not a copy of ARM uh, Neon. Um, I'll, uh, you'll see uh, soon why. Um, the designers for, of ARM Helium decided to also go for 128 bit to get this factor four um, uh, gain uh, for floating point multiplications, for example. But the problem is that data does not come from a cache, typically on a microcontroller, uh, but it comes from a local SRAM. And if you increase the data width of the local SRAM, that is a very expensive thing. So therefore, the Helium uh, specification says that you can actually, um, it's up to the chip designer to decide what uh, kind of width they want to uh, put on their bus. However, this could cause a problem. If the uh, data width is too small, you might not get this uh, factor four benefit. Um, but luckily, there are some solutions for that. And the uh, people that designed ARM Helium came up with some smart tricks that I'll talk about in the next slide. I'll also say a few words about the name Helium. So the, uh, according to this ARM blog, uh, they come up with the name Helium because it's a light, lightweight gas, and gas compared to uh, neon, uh, but also because it's atomic number two, two for two times the data width, if you would go for a 64-bit bus, uh, but you can still achieve a four times speed up. So four is the atomic mass of helium. So let's see how they did that. So in this slide, I'll try to explain that. And it's based on this idea of beatwise execution. So here in this um, small graph, you see time moving from left to right, uh, divided in four clock cycles. And the, uh, the program that you're executing is going from top to bottom. Uh, and this example program does a load, a vector load, then a vector multiply addition, then a vector load again, and another multiply addition. So this has four instructions. And in this case, you use four clock cycles to complete these four uh, instructions, which is the ideal situation because you can process four elements at the si same time, right? Let's say one element is 32 bit and you have 128 bit uh, wide uh, SIMD unit. But there is a problem. Um, because in this case, you do four elements or four beats, as they call it. Um, but that means you need this 128-bit data path because your load will load from this local SRAM. And if that is only 64-bit, then you can't complete this first instruction in this first clock cycle. So the trick here is to uh, spread those beats over different clock cycles. So you can, in this um, graph here, now at the bottom, you do only two beats per cycle. That means you can get away with a 64-bit data path and still get this vector four speed up. So as you can see here, if you look at, for example, the second clock cycle, there are two elements of the vector being loaded at the same time. So that means you need only 64 bits. You don't need 128 bit. Um, but because you have a four wide SIMD units, uh, let's benefit from it, right? So let's already start uh, processing uh, elements A and B of the next instruction. In reality, everything is a lot more complicated, of course, because you have a pipeline execution and, and, and so on. So things are not as simple as pictured here in the graph. But this is the core ID that you can still get this four times speed up by doing this two beats per cycle with a 64-bit data path. And that way, you can get to this really efficient uh, hardware uh, for microcontrollers. This is a particular, very important. There are, of course, a, bit, a few drawbacks of uh, this. Uh, not all programs fit this scheme exactly, right? For example, if you would do a couple of loads after each other, this wouldn't work. Um, so it's not as easy to get right. There might be some extra work for uh, from the programmer required or from the compiler. 
So that is ARM Helium. Le Next, let's also talk a bit about these neural networks from Plumerai. And we have to really make them uh, tiny. And we do that by vertically integrating all layers of the AI software stack. And what I mean with that is that we, when we look at all these layers, uh, right, first layer, the, the, the data pipeline, second layer, models, training strategies, and third layer, the inference engine, and fourth layer, the actual hardware that we run on, then we don't look at all of these individual layers separately, but we really always look at all of them together, right? Don't just look at the data. Don't just uh, fiddle with, uh, with model quantization techniques without looking at the inference engine and the actual hardware that you look at. And by vertically integrating all of these together, that's how we really get to these efficient neural networks. To illustrate this a bit more, to make this a bit more concrete, uh, here are some some sort of blocks that that we look at when we uh, when we create our neural networks, and it's really not just about model architecture or something, right? That's just a small component of the whole process. And if you look carefully here, you see that a lot of these components are related to data. So data for us is very important. It is even it is very important in general for neural networks, but for tiny neural networks, this becomes even even more important. And to illustrate this with a sort of a joke picture here uh, that I borrowed, borrowed from one of my colleagues, um, you could have great engineers and you could have a great model architecture and a lot of money to train this in the cloud. But if your data is labeled like this, remember, we're doing people detection. If your data is labeled like this, then uh, you won't get good results. And although this sounds a bit like a joke, it is actually uh, something that happens because these are examples from a real life uh, public data set that we got. And these, these red boxes are the labels of, of uh, people that are uh, labeled in this data set. So again, data is important and especially so for tiny neural networks. I've shown some results earlier on of um, what, how well our neural networks perform. Um, but let me show a bit more um, and look at a few categories. So they, they perform in all quite well in all kinds of different poses, as you can see here, right? standing up, sitting down, and so on. Um, they also handle occlusion very well, right? Objects blocking uh, the view, blocking people. People are just partially in view. In one example here, there's not even a head or something in view, right? So the, the neural network really has to uh, look at all these different cues of what makes a, a person a person. It also does well at different camera angles, right? For example, um, cameras mounted on the ceiling have a quite different uh, view perspective. And also in different lighting situations, right? You could think of night vision, or IR, uh, or just very dark uh, scenes. And again, these things. Uh, look very impressive, but it is even more impressive if you think that these run on very small devices, right? For example, they run relatively fast on the Cortex-A, uh, but they also run on microcontrollers. So that's, now let's bring these two together, uh, Helium on one side, and second, uh, on the other side, the uh, tiny neural networks. And um, what we did is we, um, we ported this to a Renaissance board, which is equipped with an ARM Cortex-N85. Now, this is a, a graph I took from the Renaissance uh, website where they advertise their M85. So here in green, you see the M85, and they compare it to an M7, so Cortex-M7. Um, and as you can see, the traditional performance on, on the x-axis improves a bit. Uh, newer generation uh, architecture, uh, clock by clock, by the way. Um, but if you look on the y-axis, you see that the ML performance increases by a factor four, right? So you get this factor four speed up. And that's all thanks to, uh, to Helium, because a lot of these uh, machine learning workloads can benefit from, from SIMD and vector instructions in general uh, very well. So in the next slide, I'll show 
the demo. But before I do that, uh, here's just a picture of the demo. So you can get used to uh, what you'll see on screen. So this is a picture of the of the screen that we attach uh, on top of the, uh, the Renaissance board uh, that is equipped with this uh, M85 at 480 megahertz. And it runs our people detection uh, at 13 uh, frames per second or so. And you can see it printed in the bottom of the screen. But it also runs it with very limited uh, other resources. So RAM is only at 300 kilobytes or so. And the whole binary is only 1.5 megabytes. So the whole binary, that's, that's the code, that's the, the model architecture, the model weights, everything is included in there. Uh, it's only 1.5 megabytes. And if you think uh, in the next slide, the demo, it's a bit difficult to see, or it's maybe cherry picked by us. Well, then what you can do is you can, after the presentation, go to our website, kumari.com, and um, you can actually try out the same neural networks, but then in your browser. And, um, and you can see for yourself on your phone or on your uh, laptop with a webcam, uh, what kind of quality you can get. And then remember that these run on, on microcontrollers as well. So let's go to the demo. Uh, this is a small video. Uh, I took where you can see the screen over there. You can see there's now a blue bounding box around myself. And soon two of my colleagues will, um, will also come in view. And uh, here's a green and a red bounding box. And if you look careful, they, they'll keep their same uh, bounding box. So basically uh, they are tracked as individuals. They keep their same color until they go out of view. And now when they come back in again, uh, they have different colors, of course. Um, and they go quite far away. Uh, and still um, we, we get uh, a decent performance. So let's rewind for a second here. I'll show it one more time. Um, and you can see the whole demo run. It is a bit difficult to record, of course, with the screen and reflections and so on. Um, in reality, this does look a bit better. And keep in mind also that the camera quality is not so good, which makes it also uh, quite challenging and still works quite well here. One of my colleagues is occluded for a while, but it keeps the same uh, color of the box and they go quite far away in the distance. So that's our demo on the Renesis port. So now let's go into a bit more technical details and I'll say a few words about how we became so fast. And the first step here is to use the fastest inference engine. And this is easy for us because we uh, developed the uh, fast in fastest inference engine ourselves. So the Plumerai inference engine uh, is the fastest in the world. And here I show a benchmark graph, which is on a Cortex M4. Um, this is not on the M85 because I didn't have comparisons for the other, uh, other inference engines for microcontrollers. Um, but if you see, if you look into, if you look at this graph and you look at the blue, the light blue uh, bars, you can see that we are uh, better in, in all of these four uh, benchmarks compared to others. And if you compare this to, um, to the main open source competition, uh, TensorFlow Light for microcontrollers with ARM, CM, SysNL, you can see that we're even a better 3.5 faster. And we also use LED RAM, which is not shown here in this graph. And if you think, well, this graph might be cherry picked or unfair or so on, that is not the case because this is part of the official ML Commons ML Perf Tiny benchmark suite. And this is the latest version, 1.1, but we also participated in earlier versions and were always on top uh, compared to uh, others. So the other numbers here are also um, uh, measured by ML Perf Tiny. So they ensure that all the numbers are measured correctly, but also that the accuracy is always correct as well. So all these inference engines will produce the exact same results. If you want to know more about our inference engine, um, then there's another blog post uh, that I refer to here. And there's also um, another ARM talk uh, that I presented about a year ago or so. So that is step one, a fast inference engine, basically a, a good baseline. But second step is to then add helium acceleration on top of that. And first, we'll have a look at the 
uh, composition of a typical neural network or actually a typical neural network for us, so a people detection neural network. And here I show a pie chart where we see the neural network execution time measured in percentage. And as you can see, the biggest portion is um, consumed by these 2D convolutions and fully connected layers. Um, and I'll show in the next slide how we accelerate those. There are other components as well, uh, depth-wise convolutions, transpose convolutions, pooling, and other layers. Um, and I won't uh, have the time to uh, explain how we accelerated those. But anyway, they are not the majority of the execution time. So what we did is we took the, the main three uh, neural network layer types in terms of execution time and accelerated those, right? So those are the green components. Uh, so that will be 96% is helium accelerated. And the other parts we simply did not touch, uh, although there might be opportunity to speed those up as well. But still, with 96% accelerated, and if you assume a speed up factor of four, then you can use Amdahl's law and compute the maximum speed up that you could get, given that you're uh, assuming a speed up of four as the as the maximum. Of course, there are other changes between different kind of um, architectures and so on, but that would roughly give you a speed up of 3.6 if you do it correctly. So now let's look at how we accelerated these 2D convolutions and uh, uh, the fully connected layers. So those consume the majority of the part. And all of those, uh, those two layers are actually at the core uh, computed with matrix multiplications. So what, what we have to do is accelerate matrix multiplications with helium. And we do that using this particular instruction. And I tried to pronounce this, uh, this helium instruction and struggled a bit. So I'm just calling this the Moldova instruction, which is the closest that I can, uh, can get to this. And then you might say, well, you shouldn't not try to pronounce these instructions. They're, they're from computers. But actually, if you go to the, the website of ARM, the developer page, you'll see that there's an abbreviation uh, uh, of what this, this acronym stands for, this instruction stands for. And if you look closely, this does not match one-to-one -to, -one to, um, to the instruction itself. So they did swap letters around a bit to make it more pronounceable. Um, but yeah. Anyway, for me, this is the, the Moldova instruction, uh, but it is a very important one um, because it does a lot. And um, here in this diagram, you see um, what's, what's happening as an, as an example. And in this example, they assume a vector width of four. And what it does, it takes this Q0 uh, vector and a Q1 vector. And here you can see some example values in there and it multiplies them together. And then it does not store this as a new vector. Instead, it takes those results in, in dark gray and it adds them together, uh, sort of accumulates them uh, to get this to this value. Uh, but even that is not stored. It's then added to some other uh, existing value already to produce the final result. So it does a lot of things in one go. But this is exactly what you need for matrix multiplication, right? You take a row of a matrix, you take a column of the other matrix, uh, you multiply all the uh, elements uh, pointwise, and you accumulate them all together to get the final result. So this instruction is exactly what you need uh, for matrix multiplication. Of course, not as simple as that. You need also loads. Uh, there's some, some code around it, uh, but this is the main, uh, the main ingredient. And here in this picture, they do four at a time, but actually our matrix multiplications for our neural networks are only eight bit integer. And since our vector width, the arm helium vector width is 128 bit, we can actually do 16 of those uh, multiply accumulates in a single instruction. So that's not the, the actual speed up that we get, uh, of course, because you can also do more in a, on a cortex M7, um, then just one, and also there's other instructions like you have to load the data and so on, right? But it is quite impressive what you can do in a single instruction. 
So now, so that's the, the theory, but let's look at the practice. So here I show a benchmark using the Plumerai inference engine, and we compare the ARM Cortex-M7 microcontroller to the ARM Cortex-M85. So this is our uh, inference engine that is now helium accelerated, which is only beneficial on M85. And if you compare these two numbers, you can see that we are uh, 3.6 times, because 3.6 times speed up over the M7 uh, using the same uh, already optimized inference engine. And what we measure here is our clock cycles, right? So this way you can compare uh, as if those devices would have the same clock frequency. And this is not this factor four that was advertised, but it is actually very close. And given that we uh, computed with Amdahl's law that we would only get 3.6, uh, we were very, very happy with, with this result. Now, this is Plumerai Inference Engine, our strong baseline. Um, I also include numbers for uh, the TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers plus ARM CM SysNN, which is the, the open source baseline, uh, so to say. And uh, if you look at the M85, we get a 2.3 times speed up over uh, that particular inference engine that does already have uh, some helium accelerated kernels as well. So um, that was also uh, uh, quite uh, nice to, to see. Okay. Um, so that's about uh, people detection with helium. Now, I'll also want to say a few words about things you can expect uh, from us in the future. And one of those is, um, is using the ARM ETOSU neural processing unit. So this NPU, the ETOSU, is a so-called so accelerator or coprocessor that you put on the same chip together with a microcontroller. For example, Cortex-M55 or M85. So you can see in this diagram that the ETSU is there next to the Cortex M. And ETSU is basically a multiply accumulate engine. It does these uh, matrix multiplications uh, very efficiently and also has some dedicated hardware for, for other operators that you might find in neural networks. And that way you can get uh, really good uh, speed ups, but also uh, at very low energy cost. And using this is actually not that difficult. So your, your neural network flow remains mostly as it was before. You train your neural networks, you might quantize them, you will convert them to TF light file at some point. And then the only additional step that you do is you call this VLA compiler, which then optimizes it for the ethos U. So here in this graph, I show the theoretical um, matrix multiplication speed in terms of multiple accumulates per, per clock cycle of different hardware, right? So from the M7 to the M85, that was already like a, a, a big jump for, for 8 bit. Uh, but if you go to U55, that's even another order of magnitude. Of course, that is in theory for just for matrix multiplications. In reality, you have to do a lot more. Um, but we did port our people detection to the ETHOS U55, and there we also get very impressive uh, frame rates, right? So we were very happy with 13 frames per second on the M85. But if you use a dedicated accelerator, you can get another uh, factor six or so. Um, so that is, um, that is very impressive, but you might ask, well, this ETHOS U doesn't, doesn't run all my layers. Uh, well, there might be some some problems here and there, but overall, it is its support is is very good. So in this graph from ARM, you see that um, that in a typical flow, you first uh, try to run on the ethos U. So all these operators over here are supported on the ethos U uh, itself. So that's quite a long list, not just these two D convolutions or dense layers and so on, but many more. Um, but if those are if your operator is not supported by it it will automatically fall back to ARM CMCs and N and still have relatively good optimized code to fall back on your, on your regular cortex and microcontroller. And there's also reference kernels very, for very rare operators. And in our case, for these people detection models, 99% uh, or so of the operators were covered by, uh, by ethos U. 
So that's about ETSU. Uh, then I'll, I'd like to say a few words about other products from Plumerai that can benefit from helium accelerator, acceleration and might run on microcontrollers. So one example is our people and vehicle detection. So uh, similar to what we saw before, but now we also detect vehicles. So here you see with a V, you see uh, vehicle boxes marked. And also here results are quite impressive. Again, remember that this runs on microcontrollers. Uh, with very low resolution camera and, and very limited storage and so on. Models of only one or two megabytes large. Another product that we're very excited about is familiar face identification. So here we don't just detect the person boxes. We also detect where the faces are and then we try to identify individuals. So in this example, these two people, Juan and Mayra, they have enrolled themselves uh, using a couple of example pictures of themselves. And then when they come home, their, um, uh, their video doorbell can now uh, recognize them as uh, Juan and Mayra and, uh, and can act appropriately based on that. And the nice thing about all of this is that because it runs on a microcontroller, uh, we can do everything on the bike. We don't have to send data over to the cloud. So this is a very privacy-friendly solution. We can have these this people, um, the face library basically uh, stored on the device. Nothing has, has to go to the cloud. And also this, you can actually run in your browser yourself today. So if you go to our website, you can try this out with a webcam or with your mobile phone. Uh, you can enroll yourself and your family members and see how well this performs. And again, this runs on small devices. So that makes it really, really impressive. Uh, do note that everything also runs in your browser locally. So there's nothing that, that's sent to us or something. So you don't have to worry about privacy. Everything runs locally inside your own browser. So that's it uh, from my side. Just a small recap of what we saw today. Um, so I talked a bit about uh, helium vector extensions in general, explained this bitwise execution. I said a few words about our neural networks. How do we, how do we make them so tiny and efficient? Um, I showed the demo, showed that it runs at very impressive speeds um, and also explained a bit more about why this is the case. I then showed the ETHOS U and also more applications from Plumai. So that's it uh, from my side. Thank you for your attention. Um, and I think I'll take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Wow, what an awesome, awesome tech talk. You know, we've I've been really looking forward to this one and it certainly delivered, I think, and I hope you in the audience agree, you know, really great technical depth. We talked a lot of, uh, you know, so just done a lot of great insights into uh, the technology behind helium and their use of it as well as ethos use and great demos as well um i'll tell you what we should maybe do and cedric mm -hmm. if you <laughs> if you agree if that's all right why don't we flick back to slide 34 because i want there's a couple of really great links for people to try out right i'd love people to try stuff out so i think uh, there was slide 21 and slide 34 had the links to the demos Mm -hmm. So I'll just let's leave that one up there while I've got a couple of questions. Let's do that sure. for maybe one or two questions and then flick forward to slide 34, if that's all right for those demo uh, links. So people we can paste them in and, and try it out. I've given it a go myself, not during this tech talk, of course, but beforehand uh, when I saw the slides. And it's really great fun uh, to do. So now's the time for you to get your questions in. As I said, I've got a couple, but we'd love to hear from you what your questions are. There's already a couple in here. Uh, I'll ask a couple first and then we'll head over to the Q&A box just while that populates. If you see a question you like as well, just hit the thumbs up button uh, that's in the Q&A box and I'll get to those first. So obviously, in terms of training neural networks, right, um, Cedric, there's a lot of, you know, uh, when we're training these, the images required. I imagine there's quite a lot of images that are that are needed to train uh, this kind of neural network. Are you able to share a bit more insight into how many images are used to train the people detection neural network that we uh, we spoke about earlier? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so let's see. We 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 train on on different kind of data sets, and uh, I think in in total we use around uh, thirty million or so labeled wow. images, right? And we then compress all that into a model of only one one or two megabytes large. So that is uh, uh, quite impressive indeed. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Th 30 million. That, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not 30, but 30 million. There's a lot of zeros there. So and that's that's really great. And when you're talking about that data collection bit, right, you know, you've got those um, for those data sets. Are you using public data sets or did you have your own data sets for training the neural networks? So we do actually use a, a mix of them. And so we we, we take a public data sets because they're there. Right. So we take them as much as as, as we can. Uh, but we do really have to collect our own data sets because, uh, well, I show a few examples of what public data sets look like, uh, but it's typically it's typically not enough. Also, these public data sets are, are often taken sort of from uh, with pictures of interesting things, right? You don't take pictures of boring things, uh, typically if you if you put them to on the web, for example. So we do have to uh, go around ourselves um, and record a lot of data. Also, the, the typical quality of uh, pictures in the public data sets is it's very good in terms of camera quality. But then if you try it out on a microcontroller, you typically maybe have cameras that are less than a dollar or so. So you might also have to um, uh, take, take pictures that are uh, also with these kind of cameras. Gotcha. Amazing. Thank you, Cedric. Let's flip forward a couple of slides, actually, to that other sure. uh, yep. demo link as well for people to go and check out that one as well. So they yep. have a couple of tabs open in their, uh, in their browser. And as ever, the recording and slides are all going to be available after the talk. The recording will go live immediately on YouTube. So if you join at any point or your internet connection died, just go and check it out there. Everything on there. You can pause stuff, check it out, rewind and everything. So there's the other one, uh, which is great. Let's talk about actually um, one of the things you spoke about at the beginning was ARM Neon, right, for ARM mm -hmm. Cortex A devices. Are you able to do you provide people detection for, for ARM Neon as well? Um, yes, yeah, so we do. So I showed in one of these slides that we also uh, run uh, the, these models on Cortex-A devices. And in this case, we do use the, the SIMD extensions for, ARM, for Cortex-A, which is ARM Neon, indeed, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm, I, I, one of the things I'm sure people are interested to hear is kind of how, how detailed did you get, right? Did you write any assembly code yourself or did the compiler do that helium vectorization for you? No, we had to do that ourselves, yeah. So that's uh, when you really want to get to the to the bottom of the uh, the performance, right? To get everything out, uh, you have to um, um, often write parts uh, in in assembly yourself. Yeah, but um, but the good news about this is that it's typically only a couple of lines of code, right? Which is the important part. The rest around it, you might also have to modify, but that can be in a higher level programming language. Thank you. Let's. Let, in fact, talking about the compiler, that's the top voted question at the moment uh, we spoke about. Uh, so what is the compiler used? This is from Felix. We've got a couple of questions from Felix. So what's the compiler used for the TF Light Micro slash CSM, CM sys NN comparisons? Uh, that's a good question. So I believe we use the same uh, compiler in all cases. Um, we did some experiments with the, uh, the ARM compiler, which is Clang based. Uh, but I believe most of the results, or all of the results in this slide are based on uh, uh, on the GCC compiler. So the ARM GCC uh, compiler that is freely available on the web. Gotcha. Thank you. And hope that answers your, your question, Felix. And do keep your questions going. We've got at least another few minutes uh, before we wrap up today. So do get your questions in. Uh, another question is uh, uh, from Felix here. Is the output of the Plumar inference engine for a given TF light model bit exact with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers inference engine output? That is also a, a good question. Um, it is not bit exact. Uh, in fact, I would claim that we, uh, we do better than what TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers does. Uh, there are some subtle uh, differences um, in our inference engine compared to uh, theirs. Uh, but if we compare to higher level uh, models, uh, for example, TensorFlow Keras, then we are closer um, to, to those results than TF Lite for microcontrollers. But in any case, these are about small differences, rounding, rounding differences, right, that might go move your output from eight to nine or something like that in certain uh, cases that are not that frequent. Brilliant. Thank you, Cedric. And yeah, this is your final chance to get your questions in. We've answered everything that's come in so far. Um, so do get those. 
do get those questions in. While we're waiting for the last couple of questions to come in, Cedric, is there anything final you'd like to add for our audience today as a call to action? Go and tell them to visit something, check it out. You know, and is there anything you'd like to particularly highlight to this audience uh, today based off of today's talk? Well, yeah, I mentioned uh, our website and the two demos, right, where you can really, really check it out yourself. And, and uh, if you don't believe us and, and how well it works, you can you can try it out there. And of course, if you're interested in, in any of this, uh, our inference engine or uh, the people detection models or the, the, the helium accelerated part, right, uh, then do uh, contact us. Uh, we're very happy to, to discuss and provide you with demos and so on. Yeah, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you, actually, then? Uh, do you have an email alias, or is it best to go through the web? Um, I think it's easiest to go to plumerai.com, uh, but you can also reach me at my uh, my first name, Cedric, at plumerai.com. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. We've had a question just come in while we were uh, just discussing that. What kind of pre-processing of the image sensor input is required? Um, required is a difficult uh term maybe here right we uh so we do some pre-processing um but not that not that much because um uh, we we like to make the neural network do the do the heavy lifting right it will decide uh based on training what it should do right so we do a very limited uh pre-processing just uh putting everything in the right data formats and so on uh, maybe resizing the input to some uh, some uh, basic input uh, resolution. Brilliant, thank you. And there's just a, a, a comment here from from Felix as well. Good something maybe for Felix and yourself to connect on regarding if you could include performance values. It'd be great if you include performance values with the latest ARM compiler six as well for TF like micro CMSS CMSS NN comparison. It's a bit of a mouthful. That uh, CMSS NN comparison. So maybe if you guys want to connect on that um, offline, that would be. That'd be a great opportunity to um to to just to tweak those uh, performance comparisons and performance. Okay. Values. Yeah, that's maybe a good so, idea. Yeah. So, I'm sure Felix can reach out to you. Um, so uh, that I think wraps it up for today's tech talk. Audience, thank you so much for your great questions coming in. If you do have anything further, then reach out direct to, to Cedric and the Plumerai team. Um, I was lucky enough to to meet them while I was out in uh, Amsterdam the other the other month uh, in uh, Tiny Melt EMEA. Uh, it was really great to meet them in person there. You know, they're doing a lot of fantastic work using Helium. I hope you've really enjoyed the, the talk to date. We've talked about a really lot of technical insights into Helium Vector Insta extensions, M85 comparisons across the board, Ethos U, great demos. There's some really exciting work they've been doing. So thank you to the whole Plumerai team for a great tech talk today and some great work you've been doing on Helium Vector extensions. Thank you, audience, for your fantastic questions. Do get in touch with Plumerai after the talk. Uh, and as I mentioned, we've not these are every week at four o'clock uh, UK, 8 a.m. Pacific time. And our next couple of talks are all on the infrastructure topics. So if you're interested in that, then do head to arm.com slash tech talks where you can register and register now. So you get that space secured early. You get your calendar invite in and you can attend next week, next week's tech talk at the same time. So, Cedric, thank you so much again for today's tech talk. Really appreciate all the great work you and the team have done in preparation for today and all the work you've done uh, as part of your work with Helium Vector Extensions. An audience will see you again the same time next week for another of our ARM tech talks where you can find out all the latest, greatest trends, technologies and best practices from our ecosystem partners. Thank you so much, Cedric. Yeah, and thank you for having us, uh, inviting us, the, giving us the opportunity for this talk. Thank you.